much and good evening everyone and i mean everyone the folks here in the concert hall and those folks that are out there on zoom welcome to everyone well i'm very delighted to be speaking once more to a meeting of the coburg and the district historical society i better turn this one on i've got three microphones on me This one on now? Oh, there, you there, you there you go. The one I have to remember to turn on. I always have that problem. Um, and besides that, I'm very honored to be standing in this historical space. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, my story here today is Drum Runners, the story of Ben Kerr and Prohibition. Now, off the top, I'm going to tell you that I'm not coming here telling this group about Coburg Prohibition stories. You've got folks who do that. But every town and village has their own prohibition characters and stories. In Brighton, one of our prohibition characters is Ben Kerr. He was a tall, strong, handsome fellow who loved to dress well, as you can see here. So how does Ben Kerr relate to the quiet town of Brighton? Well, it's really the story of prohibition to, from start to finish and will follow Ben from his beginnings in Hamilton through a decade of rum running. But I'm gonna start at the end in Brighton. So picture this, it's a chilly sun, a Saturday evening. It's actually March 30th, 1929 at the Brighton train station. Big black sedan comes into the parking lot, five Men get out of the car and go into the stations. Odd looking group, because one of the five is a very small young fella, early 20s. The other four are big burly guys with identical black coats and gray fedoras. You know, these guys are cops, obviously. The name of the small fella in this group was Leonard Wheat. And he was there on a very mournful task. Inside one of the many Box cars on the siding there to the east of the station was a wooden crate. And in that crate was the bones of his father, Alf Wheat. In another crate nearby were the remains of Ben Kerr. Now the job at hand for Leonard Wheat and the four policemen was to escort the remains of Alf Wheat and Ben Kerr back home to Hamilton. It was a big funeral planned for Monday. Ben Kerr was a folk hero in Hamilton. He passed his money around liberally for years. So a lot of people mourned his passing. Ben Kerr was born, John Benjamin Kerr, February 29th, 1884 in Hamilton. His father was the fish and game inspector in Wentworth County for many years. So young Ben grew up in the outdoors. He learned how to hunt and fish at an early age. He got very comfortable on the water and could handle all sorts of boats. By contrast, he also developed the ability to play piano pretty well. This is the influence of his mother. This allowed him as a young man to earn extra money playing the piano at local hotels and taverns and restaurants. Well, he was a rebellious lad. He left school at age 13. At 15, he obtained an apprenticeship with a local plumbing company. Well, Kerr grew to be very physically powerful and capable of looking after himself in the rough streets at Hamilton. He joined the union, local 67 steam fitters, and within a few years, he took on the role as the business manager for the union. So no slouch. He was also very strong-willed. He did not respond well to authority. This was demonstrated during the Hamilton railway strike in 1906. Kerr was not directly involved in the riot, which you see here in artist's rendition. He was preparing to play the piano. He was in the back room of a restaurant. A couple of soldiers came in the front door with their rifles and started bullying the customers. Well, Kerr wasn't gonna stand for that. So he went to the front, confronted the soldiers, confiscated their rifles and sent them sprawling. Well, other soldiers came in and he was arrested uh, he was really lucky to get off with a small fine. But this event established his reputation 
as a tough guy in his hometown of Hamilton. Kerr loved boats, any kind of boats, especially fast boats. Once he became established financially, he was able to purchase some land along the waterfront, Bay Street in Hamilton. He started what was called Kerr Marine. It was advertised as a boat storage business, but they also rented boats as well. This picture is from the 1940s, showing how extensive Kerr Marine became during and after Ben Kerr's time. So now Ben is an established businessman in Hamilton. And of course, he got married. He married Louisa May Behrens, August 28, 1912. Now here, typical picture of Ben, dapper dresser, and his wife Louise is right there to his left, and his mother is on his right, and the fellow way up the right side of his father. Louisa was from a respectable family, taught music lessons out of her home. It was probably that love of music that brought them together. Courtship conducted under traditional lines with chaperones and everybody behaving themselves. You know, Ben Kerr could be very charming. He was handsome and articulate. You can see the attraction. But in fact, these two young people were polar opposites in many ways. And good evidence is the honeymoon was spent camping and canoeing in the wilderness of Northern Ontario. So probably his choice. Although in those days, the dutiful wife went along. In the meantime, the Great War had come and gone and pro prohibition had come into law. Way back in 1916, the federal government had implemented a form of prohibition as part of the War Measures Act. After the war, most provinces continued with some form of prohibition except for Quebec and BC. In Ontario, the United Farmers of Ontario formed a coalition, coalition with the Labour Party, and that coalition won the provincial election in 1919. It was an absolute shock to everyone. They had no structure for governing. They didn't even have a leader at the time. But once in power, they were quick to implement prohibition. The party had largely rural supporters where attitudes were more traditional and religious. For them, Prohibition was seen as a sure way to rid the land of the evils of alcohol and therefore to elevate the Christian nature of society. There were lots of marches and uh, rallies, a lot of smashing of whiskey barrels organized largely by the temperance leagues, which were very uh, powerful at this time. Unfortunately, the euphoria at passing the law left the, the politicians either unwilling or unable to put the measures in place to actually enforce the law. So it left a complex system of confusing laws which often contradicted themselves. Now the bigger problem was that the federal government would not pass any legislation related to alcohol. This was partly because the Canadian treasury relied so heavily on the revenue from the sale of alcoholic products. But it was also because they were also already having lots of trouble with Quebec. And they didn't want to fight this battle with Quebec because we, we probably know these guys. You mention the idea of prohibition to somebody in Quebec and they'll laugh in your face. So therefore all the provinces were on their own and different regulations took, in, took over in different places. It was really quite a mess. For example, according to the Ontario Temperance Act, buying and selling alcohol was still elite, was now illegal. But manufacturing and exporting was still legal. Like, what are they thinking? <laughs> in the US, the 18th Amendment was passed in 1920. So there was now another and different set of prohibition laws in the States. Well, this was extremely confusing for everyone, citizens, business people, and politicians alike. And besides that, the fact still remained that the majority of people did not support prohibition, both sides of the border. The inevitable result was that organized crime stepped in. Rocco Perry was a dominant crime figure in Ontario in the 1920s and 30s. His wife, Bessie, was really the mastermind of the operation. She was very good with numbers and administration, very shrewd and tough as nails. Rocco was the charming front man. He glad handed and went around and made deals with everybody, but they were a very effective team. 
probably somewhere around 1920, Ben Kerr met Rocco Perry. Now it could be that Rocco was renting boats at Kerr Marine to support his smuggling operations. At this time, Ben was having serious financial trouble, having trouble paying his mortgages because there was a downturn in the economy. It was just too tempting, all that money that could be made from smuggling. So Ben Kerr began to run beer and whiskey across the lake under the organization of Rocco Perry. And he became very quickly one of his most trusted and effective smugglers. Elsewhere, manufacturing of booze carried on a place. Remember, remember, it's still legal to manufacture. Here we see the Corby distillery at Corbyville there north of Belleville. <clears throat> in fact, Corby's would be one of the main suppliers of booze for Ben Kerr and many other smugglers, smugglers during prohibition. Corby's was the largest producer of whiskey in the whole British empire. They could produce 10,000 gallons a day. The primary figures involved in Corby's, Corby's at this time would begin with Sir Mortimer Davis. He owned Corby's through his company in Montreal called Canadian Industrial Alcohol. Now, prohibition had caused his profits to go down, so he was looking for a way to solve this problem. He hired Harry and Herbert Hatch, a pair of brothers from Prince Edward County. Harry was a brash and aggressive fellow, just the perfect guy to help Sir Davis out of this mess. Almost immediately, sales increased. Officials were bribed so that paperwork could go through quickly. Policemen and judges were put on the payroll to smooth out the process. Massive amounts of whiskey and other beverages went to the wharfs at Kingston, Belleville, you know, Trenton, Picton, all the way in around the area. Much more went down the St. Lawrence River to the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, which became a major distribution point on the west, on the east coast. Harry Hatch and his brother proved to be extremely adept at this high stakes game and profits soared. Now the geography was perfect for Corby's, which is located just north of Belleville here. Dozens of trucks carrying whiskey would come from Corby's every day to the government dock in Belleville. A constant flow of boats went out at Alphys Reach and up the St. Lawrence River. Some of them would turn right and come over to Main Dock Island, which was just inside the Canadian border. And that booze would be distributed along the south shore of Lake Ontario to the east, Sackets Harbor, Oswego, and Rochester. Many more loads were taken to the west through the Murray Canal and out Presque Isle Bay, and they're down from Rochester to the west along the south shore of the lake. And guys like Ben Kerr were in great demand to support all of this traffic. Another major distillery was the Gooderham and Warts Company in Toronto. It was run by the Gooderham brothers, Sir Albert Edward and William George. Now this distillery had made the Gooderham family extremely wealthy. And these men were seen as, you know, the pillars of Toronto society. Their social and religious sensibilities dictated that the distillery would be completely closed all through the war. And after the war, it remained closed because of prohibition. So this resulted in a major distillery facility being completely closed and basically rusting every day. Step in Harry Hatch, who had a falling out with Sir Mortimer Davis and was looking for an opportunity. He approached the Gooderhams with an offer to buy their distillery. Now, initially, the Gooderham brothers would just not even talk to such a fella as Harry Hatch. But Harry was persistent and he was a good salesman. And he eventually basically said he was acquiring Goodhams in order to compete directly with Corby's. And this kind of got it over the top. The brothers even floated a big loan with a bank where they were board members. So now Harry Hatch was owner of a major distillery. More important, he owned the brand name that was associated with good quality whiskey. So production began right away. By 1926, corruption in the federal excise, federal customs and excise department was so obvious that it just could no longer be ignored. A committee reported examples of collusion between the head of the customs and excise department with some well-known bootleggers. The Honorable Jacques Barreau, the Minister of Customs, was asked to resign. 
Well, not surprisingly, he had a rather soft landing. He was picked upstairs to a seat in the Senate. <laughs> but in his department and across the government, many people lost their jobs. However, the government was still more interested in the potential loss of revenue than it was in reducing the flow of alcohol. A Royal Commission was set up to investigate the large distilleries. And they found that they had defrauded the government of millions of dollars. So charges were brought to all the major companies. Most paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in overdue excise charges and huge fines. And they paid up happily as a cost of doing business in the new world of prohibition. Well, out there in the boonies, thousands of people scrambled to make money off the smuggling of booze and to stay just one step ahead of the law. In the early years of prohibition, it was easier to operate because the OPP in Ontario and the Coast Guard in the US were seriously under-resourced. They could easily be avoided or beat in a race. One of the real characters of this period was Claude King Cole, who lived on Maine Duck Island. And we've seen by the map that Maine Duck is over here off the southeast corner of uh, point of Prince Edward County, just a few miles from the border between Canada and the United States and only a few miles from the South Shore. So Cole was perfectly positioned to take advantage of the basic geography and all that tra traffic we saw a minute ago. He purchased whiskey from Corby's and had, had it delivered to Maine Duck Island. He stored the boxes in a renovated basement of an old house some distance from his residence. It was secured with padlocks and a solid floor and thick doors. Everyone knew that this was Claude Cole's cellar supply. He would also then arrange for various smugglers to come in, take a part of his cash and make runs across the lake. Of course, he would take a cut or charge a fee for every load that went through his dock. Cole was also careful, careful to bribe just the right people. He operated just close enough to the law that it was hard for authorities to catch him in the act. There was a raid on Maine Duck Island. The police came and took his boats and confiscated all of his cellar supply. But when it came down to the nitty gritty in court, Cole was able to argue that all that booze was part of his personal supply. Look there, there's a clause right in the law. You can have a personal supply and it doesn't set any limit on it. So he went free. And the police had to return his boats and all of his cellar supply. Well, it was a perfect example of how difficult it was to actually convict a smuggler in those days. Bruce Lowry was another rum runner in Prince Edward County. He was unique among rum runners in that he ran all winter. Actually, he and Kerr were only a few that would run in the room because it was so dangerous. A part of Lowry's success was due to an unusual biological condition, which allowed him to tolerate cold to a degree that would kill most humans. And his physical courage was legendary around the county after several examples of him putting himself in danger to rescue people who were uh, struggling in a boat out in the lake. Now he was not violent like Van Kerr could be, but if you were foundering on a boat in the lake in a storm, you wanted Bruce Lowry coming to your rescue. There's a wonderful prohibition scene. The fella in the middle here holding the glass, that's Harry Ketchison. He had a farm on the north side of number two highway between Belleville and Trenton. Um, he was very heavily engaged in smuggling of booze. He, used, he had a little wharf just along the shore of the Bay of Quinney near his farm. So it worked like this. Boats would be loaded at the government dock in Belleville with whiskey that came from Corby's. The manifest would be stamped as export going to Mexico or Cuba. Of course, exporting was still legal. But of course, when the boat took off out into the bay, it didn't turn left and go up Adolphus Reach out to the uh, St. Lawrence River. No, it turned right and went quietly down the shore and stopped at Harry Ketchison's Wharf. And it was unloaded and buyers were there to, to grab it up. Um, Harry 
had a lot of friends at Presque Isle, and he was often seen lifting a glass with them. Well, let's get back to Ben Kerr and his sidekick, Alf Wheat. Here's a picture of Kerr in Trenton driving one of his earlier rum runner boats called the Evelyn, and Alf is, Wheat is sitting there in the stern. In the early years of Prohibition, as I've mentioned, Kerr operated out of Hamilton through the operation of Rocco Perry. However, as he got more confident, more successful, he began to operate independently. And he did that because he made more money that way. Now, Rocco Perry, of course, frowned on this, but he was very reluctant to confront Kerr about it. Kerr had developed the reputation as a kind of self-appointed policeman of the docks. He could act quickly to aggressively to put down, to put a bully in his place, or to just simply stop an argument. I mean, he could be pleasant and agreeable, but it was best not to confront him. Kerr was not a social animal, but there were a few activities he enjoyed outside of rim running, and one of those was the Pals hockey team in Hamilton. He was originally asked to sponsor the team, which he did, but then after a while, the coach, which is the fellow on the right here, um, started to find that the players were coming to, to the games already drunk. <laughs> and when he mentioned this to Kerr, um, well, it was obvious that Kerr was making his uh, supply of booze in a party room available to players anytime they wanted. So when he asked Kerr about this, Kerr got his back up as usual, and he said, well, if you don't like it, you can quit. And he did. And Kerr took over as coach of the team and actually coached the team to a championship. You won when you were with Ben Kerr. <laughs> this craft is called Martimas. It was Kerr's favorite rum running boat in those middle years of the 1920s. It was designed for the purpose of carrying the maximum capacity of booze across the lake. <clears throat> Kerr, of course, used all the common tricks that rum runners used. And one of the main ones was whiskey usually came in crates and you would take the whiskey bottles out of the wooden crates and put them in burlap sacks. And because it was a lot easier, easier to stuff the burlap saps into all the corners of the hold in the boat. And if you were running from the Coast Guard, you could easily pull the burlap sacks out of the hold and throw them overboard and they would sink right to the bottom, unlike a wooden crate. And it was according to the law. If they caught you and you had no booze on the boat, they couldn't charge you. And it was even better if you actually uh, tied the burlap sacks together with rope, threw the whole thing overboard. A few days later, you could come back and pull the whole thing back up. Well, this boat was perfect for this type of operation. Well, you could stay on the lake for days at a time. It wasn't the fastest boat on the lake, but it could match most of the smuggling of the, of the Coast Guard boats at the time. But early in, well, early in the 1920s, the US Coast Guard had very little capacity for catching rum runners on the lake. But finally, 1925, the American population simply got so disgusted at all the deaths and the murders that were happening that Congress finally voted millions of dollars to increase enforcement on the lakes. New cutters and what they called picket boats were built and took up station along the lakes. The cutters were large and they were designed for spending weeks on the lake. They had a crew of eight and they were armed with a one pound cannon, which could literally blow a rum runner's boat out of the water. The picket boats were much smaller, but they were also much more numerous. And they were armed with a 30 caliber Lewis machine gun on the bow. Now, in the right hands, the Lewis machine gun could sh shred a rum runner's boat, and that would be just the warning signs. Also, the picket boats could do 24 knots, which would be faster than most of the rum running boats. Another and very important improvement that was done was to increase the quality of the men that were assigned to hunt for the rum runners. Uh, policemen like Inspector William Stringer of the OPP, uh, seen here in the far left of the picture, were persistent and professional. And they had increased resources, which meant they took advantage of new technology using 
radio communications to collaborate between uh, police enforcement agencies. So there were more men, better equipment. It was getting serious. Legendary in this work were the three McCune brothers who worked for the US Coast Guard out of Oswego. All three McCune brothers had similar reputations for being tough and persistent uh, in pursuit of the rum runners. But all three possessed one key characteristic that made them particularly effective. They could not be bought. Bribery was rampant in the Coastal Service in the early years of Prohibition because there was just so much money floating around and the salaries uh, were so meager. But now hiring was much more selective and the pay had improved significantly. These new guys were serious about the work. So the rum runners couldn't use bribery uh, to get their way as they used to. In fact, Mason McCune, seen here demonstrating the Lewis machine gun, was the one who finally caught Ben Kerr. One night, Kerr was unloading Martimas off from the shore near Rochester, and he was spotted by McCune in a picket boat. Of course, Kerr had a procedure. He jammed the boat into high speed and there was a chase, but the picket boat was faster. And after a few intimidating rounds from the Lewis machine gun in the, in the bow, Kerr finally surrendered. The smuggler and his crew were arrested and Martimas was impounded as shown here. The booze was also seized. Kerr spent several months <clears throat> in a jail in Rochester. The bail was set unusually high, but his lawyer was able to reduce it a bit and they paid the bail and Kerr was able to come home. The first thing he did when he got home to Hamilton was to look up his favorite newspaper reporter. In the explosive article, Kerr announced that he would continue to run booze across the lake. He defiantly challenged the authorities around Rochester and in fact, across the entire lake to catch him if they could. Oh, needless to say, the bail money became, well, a sunk cost, if you will. Well, Kerr's response to his experience in Rochester was not to quit running booze. Actually, many rum runners did quit around this time period. Now, Kerr's response was to build a better boat. He knew that if he could outrun any of the Coast Guard boats, he could continue to smuggle across the lake. Kerr had a friend in Hamilton named Jack Morris, who was an expert boat builder. So the two men put their heads together and they designed and built a brand new boat. And Kerr Paul called it Pollywog. 40 feet long, seven foot beam, two 100, and 100 horsepower Kermath engines. And this boat could do 40 knots. It's faster than anything the Coast Guard could offer. I like to think that this craft is an example of the combination of purposeful engineering and malicious intent. It was unmatched on the lakes. And part of the speed of Polywog came from its design. There is an important feature called a tumbling stern, which allowed the boat to ride up on the top of the water at high speed, thus reducing drag. Folks at Belleville would talk about this for years. It was spectacular to be there at the government dock when Ben Kerr took off after getting a load of whiskey from Corby's. He would run the throttle way up high. It would roar like crazy. <clears throat> and initially the boat would sink right down into the water. And then all of a sudden it would leap out of the water and run ahead at an amazing speed with a huge plume of water spewing everybody getting wet behind. It was spectacular. And can't you just imagine Ben Kerr sitting there behind the wheel grinning to himself? Well, a big change occurred in Ontario, June 1st, 1927, when the Ontario Temperance Act was rescinded. So the sale of alcohol now was under government control, the good old LCBO, which we know well. The Conservatives had won a victory at an election back in December, and their leader, George Ferguson, would act quickly to comply with the majority opinion. People in Ontario were very angry. 
many, a number of gruesome deaths had occurred in the Hamilton area, around the Agra area, over the previous few months, several dozen, all from alcohol poisoning. Uh, the culprit was determined to be a large bootlegger who had support from um, organized crime. Actually, raw alcohol was smuggled back into Ontario. It was put through some kind of a chemical process and then sold to the public. And the result was often gruesome and tragic. So many people felt that this tragedy was caused by prohibition and they voted their discontent at the failed law. I couldn't resist this picture. This is when uh, one of those many parties that occurred across Ontario when prohibition was lifted. And oh, by the way, the fellow here, the second from the right, that's our old friend, Harry Ketchison, again, lifting a glass with his friends at Presque Isle. Also at Presque Isle, here's a picture of, at its prime time, there's the big hotel that was at Presque Isle, the dance pavilion at the back and the government dock. Um, of course, today, the only thing left in that spot that you can see is the government dock. So how does this relate to Ben Kerr? In 1927, the situation to the west end of Lake Ontario got very dangerous for Ben Kerr. The OPP and the Coast Guard were increasing their patrols and they were much more effective. But he was also more and more concerned about his fellow smugglers. Large criminal organizations had, from the United States, had established themselves in the Hamilton area to take advantage of all this money being made from the smuggling of booze. In light of that, Rocco Perry was under a lot of pressure to end independent operators like Ben Curry, taking money out of their pockets. So Kerr realized that it was time to get out of Dodge. And so he moved his base of operations from Hamilton to Whitby Harbor thought that was far enough to the West to be away from the gangs and the cops. And of course, under these new, more dangerous conditions, Kerr spent longer times out in the lake. He started to use radio communications to arrange for loads and to see where the cops were operating. Now, it's interesting to note that in the early 1920s, Kerr would say that he was doing this rum running, rum running in order to pay off his mortgages and to develop a retirement fund. But as time went by, it was pretty obvious that it was more of a personal challenge to him. He was motivated to win each time. And in his mind, that meant defying authority. And if he could, rubbing their face in it. This time, so then within only a short number of months, uh, members of a very violent gang showed up in Whitby Harbor, right beside Pollywood. Ben Kerr realized it was time to move on again. So this time, he went to Presque Isle. Presque Isle Bay. Now at that time, and so Presque Isle was perfect because it was far enough to the east. It was out of the area of the gangs and, uh, uh, and the cops and very close to Corby's. So easy to get the whiskey. And beer from Quebec was a primary product at this time in great demand in New York State. And it would come down to St. Lawrence, so he was handy to that. At the time, Presque Isle Hotel was a popular summer resort run by a businessman, Grant Quick of Gosport. You know, thousands of people came every summer to stay at the hotel and to rent cottages along the shore. Camping was popular as well. However, all of the campers and cottages, cottagers went home in September. So for a curr who wanted to run in the winter, it was a perfect place. In the fall of 1928, Ben Kerr and Alf Week took up residence in the cottage that was just immediately east of the hotel. There's actually a story that says that Kerr wanted to play the piano that was in the hotel, a beautiful piano. Well, the proprietor refused. This is a family establishment. So Kerr paid to have the piano moved over to the cottage for a time so he could play. And uh, Pertel Quick was a, a nephew of Grant Quick. He actually had helped move the piano. He said that you often could hear the sound of Kerr playing the piano at the cottage way across the bay at the Gosport fish plant. 
Well, Kerr kept pretty much to himself when he was here at Presque Hill. Um, everybody knew who he was and what he was doing, but everybody also knew it was good to kind of leave Ben Kerr alone. Kerr and Wheat made several runs across the lake from the cottage at Presque Hill in that fall of 1928 <clears throat> and the winter of 29. Again, the traffic was largely in beer at this time. The weather had been unusually bad during that winter of 28, 29. There was a lot more snow than usual. And it also meant there was much heavier pack ice out in the lake than normal. During one trip in January of 29, Kerr and Wheat had spent a frigid night stuck in an ice floe. Now they managed to get themselves free uh, the next day and get back home, but they had a quite a close call. Late in February, Kerr planned another trip. And in spite of all good advice to the contrary, on Sunday, February 24th, Pollywald roared out of Presque Hill in the afternoon. They made the difficult crossing of the lake to their rendezvous point near Rochester. Now reports from people who were there on the other side said that the exchange of booze went off without a hitch. However, there'd been some damage to the boat in the difficult crossing through the ice flows, and he had used up a lot of his fuel during that trip. Kerr was urged to come into the shore and fill up his gas tanks, but he refused. He was afraid of getting caught on the US side. As he said, I ain't gonna rot in no American jail. He was kind of balancing his risks. The next day, Pertel Quick noticed that Polywog was not parked out in front of the cottage as usual. He attempted to drive out to the west end to the bluffs to see if the boat was stuck in ice out there, but there was a blizzard going on, so he couldn't go anywhere. It was another six days before associates of Kerr and the rum running fraternity got together and started to look for the lost sailors. Ben Kerr's wife asked Jack Morris Jr., the son of the boat builder, to go look for them. Well, the area search, the aerial search centered around Maine Duck Island because that's where everybody thought they would probably be. The weather, however, didn't cooperate and they didn't get near Maine Duck for several more days. But when they finally were able to fly over the area, they saw nothing, no boat or men. In the morning of March 20th, 1929, Aaron McGlennon was walking his dog near his home at McGlennon's Point, which is a little west, um, yeah, a little west of Lockport. Suddenly the dog started barking at something uh, under some roots at the shoreline. When he investigated, McGlennon was shocked to see a human hand bo bobbing in the water. He looked closer and he found several other pieces of a human body. He collected all that he could find at the time and put him in an empty chicken coop and went to call the OPP. Within the next few days, more parts of the body were discovered in the ice along the shore. Now it was thought that this might be the remains of Alf Wheat, uh, Ben Kerr's mate on Pollywog. And this was confirmed when Alf, Alf Wheat's son, Leonard, came to Brighton where the inquest was being held. He was able to identify the body of his father based on a tattoo of Rose which was his first wife. A few days later, Ben Kerr's body was found floating in the ice near the shore. The body was intact, but very battered. There was one piece of clothing left, and that was a woolen sock, which was used to identify the body. Now, when the ice was gone and the weather permitted, further investigation was done there in the area where the bodies were found. Various pieces of the boat were recovered, such as the gas tanks. One important piece that was salvaged was a bent propeller, which was identified as the type on the polywog. Pertel Quick managed to obtain this propeller and was able to tell a pretty good story for many years later. This picture is actually taken on the uh, Gosport dock. Some folks were not convinced that it was polywog that broke up off McGlennon's point in 1929. It was not until 1994 that two Colburn divers finally found Pollywog's two powerful engines. That finally put an end to the story. So what exactly happened out there on the lake? Well, we'll probably never know for sure, so we have to use best information. 
Ben Kerr refused to take on fuel on the US side of the lake. As a result, his fuel supply was limited when the boat encountered the extra thick and high pack ice on the North shore. When salvaged, the gas tanks from Pollywog were found to be completely empty. It looks like Pollywog ran out of gas a few hundred yards from the shore, stuck in pack ice. So Ben Kerr's luck finally ran out. But run running continued. And that was until the Americans rescinded prohibition totally in December of 1933. So as a result, money, the flow of money dried up for the smugglers and the rum running days were over. So whatever happened to Bessie Perry? Well, Bessie was shot and killed in her home, August 30th, 1930. The culprit was never caught, but it was expected that a gang member had killed Bessie based on some business deal gone bad. April 23rd, 1944, Rocco Perry simply disappeared from the streets of Hamilton. His body was never found. Speculation has it, however, that his body is probably encased in cement at the bottom of Hamilton Harbor. <laughs> Claude King Cole managed to maintain ownership of Maine Duck Island, but was in serious financial trouble when he suddenly died at his farm in Oswego in 1938. Bruce Lowry banged around from one job to the other, mostly in smuggling and booze. He escaped from the law several times. Eventually got married, wanted to settle down. So he made some calls to some friends looking for you know, a real job. Well, guess who? <laughs> Harry Hatch offered him a job at the warehouse at Gooderham and Warts and he worked there until he retired. And when asked about it, Harry Hatch said, that if the distillery in industry owes anyone a job, it would be Bruce Lowry. Harry Hatch became one of Canada's wealthiest businessmen. He was able to indulge his love of horse racing. Uh, he developed his own stable, which won the King's Plate five times. Well, Harry never stopped operating. Just before the US removed prohibition, he had already begun building a humongous distillery in Illinois against all common sense of the time. In fact, it proved to be a boon to his business empire because after prohibition was gone in the US, Americans could drink again. Well, Harry Hatch knew it very well. Prohibition was really all just about money. Now, the source of much of the information about Ben Kerr and the Rum Runners comes from two terrific books by the author C.W. Hunt. Whiskey and Ice focuses on Ben Kerr while Booze, Boats and Billions deals with the broad scope of prohibition. I was really lucky to be able to have a good discussion with Mr. Hunt about telling this story out of his books uh, about a year before he passed away in late 2016. And I'm happy to honor him and his terrific work. Well, that's my story about Ben Kerr and Prohibition. Of course, you can always check out my website, Dan Buchanan History Guy, to find out what I'm up to. Uh, I have copies of my own books here at the table, as well as there's some copies of the Whiskey and Ice book as well, just for five bucks to get them moved. Uh, anyway, thanks very much for your attention. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Thank you.